I have often wondered what drives the huge electrical currents that we see flowing across the universe. The Thunderbolts project often refer to Alvin's galactic circuit. So let's explore what this is and how he came up with the idea. This story starts with the discovery of a strange double radio source. These were one of the most puzzling problems in astrophysics at the time, and we're talking the 1970s. These sources were emitting huge amounts of energy and often had a galaxy situated right between the two sources. At the time, there were two explanations for these. One line suggested that there are stellar objects at the centre of each of the radio sources which were emitting radio, essentially like radio stars. None, however, have ever been found. The other theory suggests that the galaxy at the centre has emitted two jets in opposite directions which in some way have been kept together during their long travels. None of these models could explain where the energy to power this double source actually came from. Modern theory still suggests that these are caused by active galactic nuclei producing two persistent oppositely directed plasma outflows that contain cosmic ray electrons and magnetic fields. It is believed that these plasma jets are formed by the accretion disk that form around a massive black hole like the one at M87. Here the jets are powered by the accretion disk and we are we're not going to discuss the problems with this model in this video. Alvin goes on to discuss the main problems he faced at the time regarding the approach to plasma physics. Current plasma physics has moved on significantly and adopted many of Alvin's ideas, but let's briefly cover his main gripes. He points out that many plasma phenomena are ignored by cosmologists, listing them as follows. Electrostatic double layers, current sheath, pinch effect and critical velocity. He points out that plasma cannot simply be studied by calculations as the behaviour can often be very complicated and require in situ measurements. And it is important that a new approach is needed and should be based on the recognition of the fact that the plasma has general patterns of behaviour which, in important respects, are the same in the laboratory and in the ionosphere, the magnetosphere and the heliosphere and these results can possibly be used to extrapolate further out. In this paper, he intends to demonstrate that certain observed processes in the laboratory may be used to explain these double radio sources. When an electric current is passed in a discharge tube, it often produces electrostatic double layers. This is nothing new and has been known for about 100 years. These double layers will form even if there is no magnetic field present and this will cause an acceleration to the charged particles and no appreciable electric field. Double layers are often produced at the point where the diameter of the discharge tube changes. The energy released in the double layer can be so large that it can cause the glass tube to glow or even implode. These double layers often oscillate and emit noise with a broadband frequency spectrum. In this setup, the power is supplied by a voltage source in the circuit, which could be located at any distance from the setup. The energy is transferred to the double layer through the electrical circuit, and the behaviour of the double layer depends not only on the plasma parameters near it, but also on the resistance and the inductance in the whole circuit. Larger inductance would cause the double layer to explode, and as the circuit is broken, the magnetic energy is released very rapidly. This means that the plasma column can be likened to a metal wire surrounded by an insulator and the double layer as a non-linear circuit element. We know that at the dawn side of the auroral zone, there are currents flowing into the auroral zone at high latitudes and leaving the zone at lower latitudes. At the evening side, these currents will be reversed. These currents flow in sheets along the magnetic field lines and are called Birkeland currents. The circuit is closed in the upper ionosphere and in the plasma near the equatorial plane. A spacecraft passing over these would measure a voltage inversion. Above the double layers, the equipotential lines form cylinders around the current-carrying flux tube 
similar to what happens in the laboratory. Below the double layer there is a beam of high energy electrons accelerated at least in part in the double layer. Most of their energy is dissipated in the ionosphere where they produce the aurora. Again, this is similar to the laboratory experiments where the charged particles are accelerated in the tube. He identifies that the main sources of this energy in the magnetosphere circuit is the kinetic energy of the sunward plasma due to the solar wind. To date, only the equatorial plane current system has been measured. These show that the radial component of the current is about 3 times 10 to the 9 amps. From Kirchhoff's law, we can conclude that this current flowing towards the sun must be closed by currents leaving the sun, which means that there must be a high latitude outward current, which in the case of symmetry would be 1.5 times 10 to the 9 amps in each hemisphere. How close to the axis these currents flow is unknown, but it is highly likely that the polar plumes in the solar corona mark their footprint. If we compare the heliospheric and the auroral current system, we may see similarities, however there are some important modifications that need to be made. Number 1. The main EMF is produced by the Sun, which acts as a unipolar inductor. Now, by unipolar inductor, what we're talking about here is uh, a, a rotating magnetic field with uh, a conducting medium inside of it. And when that rotates, it generates an electric current. So it's effectively acting like a sort of a generator. It is producing through the rotation uh, a potential difference which will drive the current flow. Number two, as the current is large enough to modify the dipole field considerably and because of the solar wind, the equatorial current extends over a very large region and is spiralling. Further, the poleward branch of the Birkeland current is moved close to the axis. This circuit must be closed at a great distance from our sun. Now, if the analogy from the auroral circuit is true, we must expect to find a double layer high above the sun in the polar areas, probably located on the axes. If we take the heliospheric circuit and we replace the sun with a galaxy, which equally has a magnetic field and is also rotating, we would expect a similar current system. Inside the galaxy, the current may flow in the plane of symmetry similar to the current sheet in the equatorial plane of the Sun. The EMF which is derived from the rotation of the galaxy is applied to two circuits in parallel, one to the north and one to the south. Most galaxies have a symmetrical structure above and below the plane of rotation, so it's a fair assumption that these two circuits would be similar. In the magnetosphere, the current flowing out from the ionosphere produces double layers some distance from the Earth. We would therefore expect a similar configuration in the galactic configuration. Double layers above the rotational axis and a large release of energy within them. It is therefore Alvin's hypothesis that these double radio sources are produced by this continuous energy release at the double layers. In the galactic circuit, the EMF is produced by the rotating magnetized galaxy. This implies that the energy must be draining the rotational energy of a galaxy as it is transferred to the double layer. If this process is similar to the aurora, there must be a flow of thermal electrons from the outside towards this double layer. And when passing the series of double layers, these get accelerated to very high energies. Hence a beam of very high energy electrons is emitted from the double layer along the axis towards the central galaxy. In this analogy, the current in the equatorial plane of a galaxy may also produce double layers, which may be associated with large releases of energy. So how do these findings compare with observations? In the diagram, we see an example of a double radio source. And in our circuit, we would see ions being accelerated outwards from the galactic center. And this is exactly what we observe. Massive plasma jets push out ions from the core of the galaxy. And when these ions meet the double layer, 
they are accelerated outwards. The movement of the ions creates strong magnetic fields which pinch the plasma into cylinders close to the axis of rotation. The electrons would move along the outer edge and when they reach the double layer will be accelerated towards the galactic centre. Due to the strong magnetic field created by the outward Birkeland currents, these electrons will follow a spiral pattern, releasing synchrotron radiation in the process. And as they move further from the double layer, these emissions will reduce. And this matches what we see in these double radio source images. Alvin goes on to discuss that the energy for this circuit could be supplied simply by the rotational energy of the galaxy. He shows that as long as the voltage of the galaxy is greater than the voltage of the double layer, the current will continue to grow. And once they are equal, the current is constant. He calculates that the inductance of our galaxy could be as large as 10 to the 15 Henrys, and the magnetic energy as much as 10 to the 50 joules. He calculates that the kinetic energy of the galaxy rotation is about 10 to the 53 joules, showing that the magnetic energy is only a small fraction of the total energy. If the voltage of the galaxy were ever to drop to zero, then the current would continue to flow, but would decrease over time, taking approximately 300 million years to cease. Under certain conditions, double layers are known to explode, and if this were to occur, the voltage drop would increase rapidly. And this may account for double radio sources suddenly brightening for a short period of time, and the creation of cosmic rays as the ions end up being accelerated to very high velocities. Now there are some points that I would like to make about this concept. Number one, no external energy is required to run this process, so from his point of view this is run purely by the rotational energy of the galaxy. Number two, it still raises questions about how the galaxy was formed in the first place. And also during that formation, how the rotation would have started. Number three, we should be able to observe older galaxies which have slow rotation rates, therefore proving that this would be a mechanism uh, driving the, the energy in the galaxy. Older galaxies would therefore rotate slower. The problem is that observing these older galaxies ex is extremely difficult, let alone measuring the difference in redshift between one side of the galaxy and the other, which is how they currently work out the rotation speed of galaxies. And currently we can only really do this for galaxies nearby. Hopefully in the future, as our telescopes improve, we should be able to observe this and identify whether this is something that is happening with older galaxies. Number four, if this is hierarchical, almost fractal in nature, how does the galactic circuit fit into the larger circuit? Now we know that galaxies form um, cosmic filaments, uh, so was this only to generate the galaxy? Um, as in the, the plasma flow pinch creating the start point of the galaxy. N number five, which is kind of connected to this, is how are star circuits connected to the galactic one, if at all? Now we know that there is obviously an outflow of current or an outflow of electrons along the arms of the, the galaxy. Now it would be silly to assume that that doesn't interact with any of the, the stars that sit in its path. Again, if we go back to the analogy of jumping up, looking at the auroral circuit, it is a closed loop, so the, the electrons move around and around and the, the ions get pulled upwards. That process is driven by the solar wind, and the solar wind doesn't necessarily uh, enter into that circuit, but it, 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 its interaction with it causes that movement. So therefore, is this some process by which the, the galactic current is able to add energy into the sun? And therefore, is it possible to assume that galactic or intergalactic Birkeland currents, which potentially seeded the galaxy, are also a mechanism to supply extra energy into the galaxies? Again, it's a big question. 
Number six, um, I also find it particularly interesting that when we overlay ARP's idea of galaxy formation onto this galactic circuit, that there are some ideas which I think are linked. Now ARP, through his meticulous study, theorized that quasars were formed in active galactic nuclei and that they were then ejected at high speed and then slowed down as they moved further out, eventually reaching an outer limit. Um, and at that point, when they reached the outer limit, they would sort of start to turn backwards. Now, interestingly enough, when we look at that evolution, then he theorized and from his observation, he saw that these objects, as they moved further out, tended to migrate from being a quasar into small dwarf galaxies into larger galaxies. So are these energetic quasars being created through this outward current at potentially a double layer? Or is there some other mechanism inside which causes this? Are they then being pulled outwards along these Birkeland currents that flow out of the, the top of the, the galaxies, which is exactly where ARP saw the quasars being ejected? In ARP's theory, there is an outer limit. Now, is that outer limit where the edge of the current flow sits, where this extra double layer that creates these double radio sources is? Do these objects get pulled along by the magnetic field or the Birkeland currents? And they are themselves still active. Uh, potentially, you know, they are a Z-pinch traveling along this Birkeland current. Um, as they move further outwards, slowly the, the process is they're recombining, they're losing some of that energy. The, the plasma is turning back to neutral media. So is that process of recombination into neutral atoms, once they reach their outer limit, they are therefore not being affected by the magnetic fields. And therefore, do they then gravity takes over and starts to pull them in, which is why you see that change in, tra in trajectory in, in ARP's theory. Now, it doesn't quite work because that, as beautiful as that sounds, that doesn't necessarily explain then how um, the, 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 the galaxy starts to rotate. But maybe it is that at that early stage, there really isn't any rotation. But then the question is, where does that rotation come from? Because we're saying that galaxies are active circuits, they have active magnetic fields, so therefore you would expect these to still interact with those Birkeland currents. I just find it interesting that there are these similarities between Alvin's circuit and the notion of ARP's uh, galactic formation through, through quasars. Now, they are certainly very different theories, but maybe Art's meticulous cataloguing should not be forgotten, as there may well be clues in that data to help unlock the mystery of what these gigantic stellar objects are actually doing and how they actually form. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.